Introduction to Rasa Shastra, The Hidden Art of Medical Alchemy, published by Singing Dragon in April 2014. My principal aim in writing this book was to record all of my exploits in Sri Lanka between the winter of 2004 and the late summer of 2005. During this time, I attempted to immerse myself fully in Vedic alchemy. I already had some background in Ayurvedic medicine and was very intrigued with the use of their alchemical ingredients in certain formulas. These included such materials as mercury, arsenic, iron, copper, gold, silver, gemstones, along with a number of important animal products such as deer horn, cuttlefish bone, pearls, mother of pearl and other calcium carbonates. When I was first exposed to these materials being used as ingredients in other complex Ayurvedic formulas, I was initially sceptical. Could these materials really be processed into something with outstanding medicinal potency? By effectively marooning myself on the island for a year, I had, to all intents and purposes, every day to unravel this mystery. The following slide is a list of many of the materials used in Rasa Shastra. This arrangement is fairly typical and found in most of the pharmacies throughout India and Sri Lanka. For the ease of the reader, I have translated these materials into English. However, there are one or two materials in this list which are not universally agreed upon, and where any uncertainty remains, I have given the best scholarly guess. For the most part, the list remains quite self-explanatory, with materials such as metal, precious gems and semi-precious gems being categorised together. That being said, there are one or two inconsistencies. For instance, I had not been able to find any satisfactory explanation as to the arrangement of the first three columns. My ultimate conclusion to the arrangement of these lists was that materials were based more on availability rather than potency. It can also be noted the metal, mercury, sits atop this table. This is because mercury has a special place in Rasa Shastra and is seen to reside beyond all other elements. Indeed, it is its unique property to conjoin with other materials that makes us liquid metals so auspicious and desirable. In essence, I've broken the book down into four bite-sized sections. The first part is simply titled, What is Rasa Shastra? In this first section, I attempt to answer that question, giving the reader some philosophical as well as historical backgrounds to this ancient practice. I also introduce this system's correlation to its sister science, Ayurveda, and how the two work so well together, particularly in matters of Rasayana, i.e. those practices which seek to rejuvenate and regenerate, as well as increasing longevity, something that Rasa Shastra medicines are particularly famed for. In the following section I concentrate on the nature of the workshop, its equipment, methodology and apparatus. This section of the book also details many of the step-by-step -step processes involved in the manufacture of Rasa Shastra medicines, as well as the ideal environments in which to carry out these processes. There's also a detailed analysis of the methodology behind Rasa Shastra, how to take base materials and apply Shodhana, a word that might be translated as purified or perfected, as a number of materials used in Rasa Shastra are inherently toxic and therefore require very specific levels of purification in order to be assimilated by the body without producing toxic side effects. One important aspect of Rasa Shastra is the pharmacy itself. The initial setup of the building is extremely important, its location, functionality and above all practicality. As is shown in the book, even the location and the orientation of the pharmacy is extremely important, relying on its sister science Vastu to correctly locate and balance the structure to make sure that it is in total harmony with the environment. The third section concerns itself mainly with the processing of materials. I have selected metals, gemstones, animal products and plants. Under each of the former headings I then go on to detail three specific items. In the section pertaining to metals, I focus on the preparation of copper, tin and zinc. In the section on gemstones, I look at diamond, red agate and blue sapphire. Under animal products, I consider deer horn, pearl and peacock feather. And finally, in the plant section, I look at datura, aconite and balataka. In the final section of the book, I consider Jyotish, or Vedic Astrology as it's better known. 
I decided to include this section as many pharmacies I was allowed to observe employed some form of astrological calendar. That is to say, while preparing medicines, the current positions of planets, the rising sign, and most importantly, the current lunar phase, were considered to impact the end result of the medicine being made. I also noted that under certain circumstances, a patient's personal horoscope would be consulted prior to the giving of medicine by looking at the positions of planets in their natal chart and comparing them with their current transitory positions. The physician attempted to determine the effectiveness of the medicines being given. Additionally, some treatment plans would employ the use of prajna charts, that is, a chart drawn up at the moment the patient arrived. This too would be considered to have some bearing on the final effectiveness of the therapy being recommended. And while I recognise that these techniques might appear highly esoteric to those of a Western mindset, the fact that these methods are employed and used to good effect with some treatments, I felt, are more than justified in this section of the book. And finally, in a kind of pre-summing up, I wanted to introduce the small Rasa Shastra gallery. These are a number of colour plates that appear in the middle of the book. The first five colour slides presented here detail some of the processing of liquid mercury. In the first image, liquid mercury is mixed with a number of different mediums, including the juice of crushed garlic cloves, trifola decoction, and the expressed juice of beetle leaves. Interestingly, one hallmark of this addition is to produce a kind of beaded effect, where the introduced medium has broken the mercury into micro-metallic globules. The second image shows the inevitable intervention of machines into the process of manufacturing rasa medicines. And while the machine element does reduce the hardship of human labour, it's not entirely clear what the end effect on the medicine is, whether their introduction to the process improves or detracts from the medicine. The machine pictured here literally is just a mixing device, a very simple piece of apparatus which literally stirs the mercury for up to nine hours. The third slide in this sequence shows a sample of mercury being amalgamed with finely sheeted gold, which has been cut into very small pieces. This gold amalgam is then stirred for approximately nine hours. The final amalgam of the two metals produces an interesting effect as the mercury loses all but all of its fluidity. Much of the purified mercury is eventually mixed with purified sulphur. Here is an example of sulphur being purified. In this slide we see a large earthenware bowl filled with milk and solidified sulphur. Sulphur is literally heated until liquid, poured through a fine cloth and then cooled rapidly in the milk contained within the pot. Normally this process is repeated three times and in some cases six times. Having undergone six levels of purification, the sulphur can then be reground and combined with the mercury, this then forming a mercuric sulphide. And mercuric sulphide forms the base of many popular rasa medicines. This rather precarious looking piece of machinery quite literally mixes sulphur and mercury together. The two wooden paddles positioned in each of the mortars literally push the powdered sulphur and liquid metal together to form a black mercuric sulphide. And although a rather crude method of mixing the powder, it is effective. This next slide shows the method of heating many of the rasa samples. The construction is simply known as a putter. This very crude apparatus is literally a set size of hole dug into the ground and filled with a number of dried cow dung cakes. This particular image shows what's known as a maha putter or great putter, containing about 1500 dried cow dung cakes. A number of different putter sizes have been given in various texts on what best suits the material being heated. However, contrary to popular belief, the larger putters do not generate any more heat than the smaller putters. Merely, the peak period of heating is maintained for longer in a larger putter. The temperature range of all putters is somewhere between 850 and 900 centigrade. And finally, I end with a couple of photos taken at the facility where I was working in Sri Lanka. Here I am working on the final stages of a mercuric preparation. Quite simply, the mercuric sulphide was placed into a bottle and heated at high temperature. During this process, the sulphur is vaporized leaving a small amount of red mercuric crystals which cluster around the neck of the bottle. To access these crystals, the bottle is broken, and in this image, I'm retrieving those crystals. 
The final postcard, if you like, is a shot of the production facility where I was working. This particular snapshot in time I took late one afternoon. While wrapping up one or two of my preparations, the skies decided to open and a torrential downpour ensued, the sudden rain literally swelling the nearby river and flooding everything about me in seconds. To my amazement, once the shower had passed and the sun had returned, all vestiges of the downpour were evaporated in less than an hour, giving you some idea of the ambient temperature. As can be seen, the working conditions at the facility were quite basic. That being said, the area was extremely quiet and rural, and boasted a significant amount of local herbs, as well as fresh fruit and inquisitive wildlife. I've come to the end of my short presentation now, but in summing up, some added notes about this book. Firstly, and as far as I'm aware, this book is one of a kind. That is, the subject of Rasa Shastra being presented by a Western author. Secondly, I hope I provided a very unique and hands-on approach to the complexities of Vedic alchemy. In this book, I've tried to cover the essential information for the reader to grasp a basic understanding of Rasa Shastra. To help in this regard, the book is profusely illustrated, with many classical references and an extremely useful quick reference guide, whereby I detail many of the medicinal properties of the materials used in this ancient science. If you've enjoyed listening to this presentation, perhaps you might find my other two presentations of interest as well. These are Jyotish, The Art of Vedic Astrology, and Vedic Palmistry, or Hastareka Shastra. Thank you for taking the time to listen. For more details or contact, please see the end slides. <laughs>